Hey folks, Mr. Justin here with Secret Weapon Miniatures and another Workbench Wednesday. Uh, well, first, I want to thank you for joining me again. I hope you've come uh, for, well with some questions and prepared to have some fun. Of course, if this is your first time joining me, please remember to uh, subscribe to the page, hit the little bell, all the things you need to do in order to make sure that you uh, don't miss any episodes and that you can uh, follow along with us. Um, today, I'm going to have fun again. Um, but before I jump into that project, I have something very special under my desk that I will be starting next week uh, for the Nova Open Charitable Foundation. Uh, with incredible thanks to Games Workshop for their support of that, uh, well, organization. And yeah, I'm actually going to duck into my local Games Workshop store here in Sacramento at Lake Crest Village. Uh, where the manager, Joe, is going to keep me company while I do some work on the Stomp Out with Belly Gun. It's a piece I've wanted to do for a long time, and it's going to be raffled off when it's finished to support a charity. So yeah, you can definitely see that uh, this might be my kind of thing, right? <laughs> Of course, I'm still going to have to make a little plastic insert to actually rifle the barrel there. And don't tell me that orcs don't rifle their barrels. I don't care. I want to make a little rifling for the barrel because I can. Okay? Grumpy old mama. Mama do. But no, this is a really fantastic piece. And uh, yeah, Forge World did a great job with this. And I really do uh, look forward to starting that project next week. And it is going to be the subject of several... Uh, different Workbench Wednesday episodes, particularly since uh, uh, there are so many different things I get to talk about, like um, uh, combining resin and plastic models, um, the weathering, the painting, the masking, the uh, extra detailing. Uh, I am giving this uh, absolutely my all, uh, since it is going to be raffled off for the charity. It's, yeah, you're going to see an awful lot of that model, and I'm going to have an awful lot of fun. I'm very excited. Thank you again to the Nova Open Charitable Foundation to Games Workshop, Forge World, and to, well, Joe at the Lake Crest Village Games Workshop store here in Sacramento, California. All right. Now some modeling. Let's make some models. That's what we're going to do. So if you've uh, been following along, you'll... That, hey, look, an extra new Kukola sign. You'll recognize the... 1972 pickup that I've been working on, uh, which is, hmm, well, the color is really bad on this today. Whee! See if that helps a bit. Not a lot, but uh, that's what I get for forgetting to do white balance before the episode. My bad, Moo Moo, for now, uh, it'll do. Um, but yeah, uh, you might remember the truck that I've been working on. This was inspired by a truck uh, that's actually in my neighborhood. So I have reference photos from the real thing. Here are the uh, tabs that would have held on the siding here. But of course, yeah. Oh, and Charles has a question. Uh, you wonder if a course tap would work for the rifling? Uh, well, one of the things that I tend to do is just take a, a sheet of, uh, oh, uh, what, third of a millimeter or smaller, uh, if I have it, um, plastic guard, and just score the rifling into it, uh, cut a strip, fit it into the barrel, good to go. Uh, pretty simple thing, but I'll definitely demonstrate that uh, during the broadcast. Uh, well, next week, or at least sometime soon, as soon as I get to that part of the project. Um, another way to do it is with brass, uh, because you can get that even finer, uh, and it holds that shape very easily. But we'll talk about that later. It's going to be great. Ah, I'm so excited. All right, so back to the truck. I Unfortunately, I have not had a chance to look at this again uh, since the last time I had it on the show. Uh, no time to work on it. Um, so it's nice to get back to it, but it takes me a second here to 
figure out where I'm at and what we're going to do next. Um, I still have the uh, cab in a very unfinished state, uh, so I'll need to uh, work on that today too. And of course, the other uh, fun item for today is, uh, since I'm going to be weathering that, continuing the weathering on my Nuka-Cola toothpick dispenser. Ka-ching! Come on out, toothpick. And then get lost. So I'll continue weathering this today, too. Um, and having some fun with some highlights in here. Uh, which, uh, yeah, we're actually going to do with... Oh, oh, come back, come back, come back, come back. A pencil. I do a lot of my uh, fine line highlights like this with a pencil. Um, in fact, we'll have to start there. Because that's fun. I do think it's funny that uh, this extra little, I was trying to see how small I could get it and still make it legible. So I have this tiny little Nuka-Cola right here. Bink. And uh, I found it in the bed of the truck. So now I'm suddenly wondering, I'm like, well, it's not uh, its not how it looks in the real world, but uh, maybe he needs a little, uh, little Nuka-Cola bumper thing. I don't know. A little nod. Or maybe it'll still wind up here or something, which is what I was trying to do. But for now, let's talk about those highlights. All right. First, a visit from my trusty Manhattan. And then a white pencil. In this case, I am using the Artist Loft Fundamentals Watercolor White Pencil. Um, I prefer the watercolor pencils uh, to, uh, well, anything else like the Compi crayons and whatnot, um, because uh, the water, the nature of them, the fact that they're a watercolor pencil, uh, makes it very easy for you to, um, well, blend your white into the model. Yeah, anyway, I'm just going to show you. Makes more sense if I just show you. So I can take this watercolor pencil and come in here and find these spots that I would want to highlight and really just seriously just hit them with a really thick line from my watercolor pencil. Now you're thinking, Justin, that looks like crap. And you're right. But that's okay. And that's why I use a watercolor pencil, because in a second, you'll see how we fix that and make it look awesome. All of this, of course, was painted with the secret weapon rust set and the new mech acrylics. So this is Comet Red, same as the truck. I'm really happy with that color. All right, so there are my big chunky lines, and yeah, that's that is. Yeah. Well, that's already better, and then Blends in nicely. And now you can see I have those highlights. But they're much softer. Uh, they actually look much harsher in the light. Uh, but that's, uh, that's how it would photograph. Let me uh, keep cleaning up. Only this time I'll keep looking at the camera. There we go. That's really good. Let's just add a little more down here. So what's fun about this particular technique, and uh, 
Let me see if I have a, a piece here to give you a good demonstration. Well, I can actually demonstrate it right here. We're going to highlight the edge of this. So when you're doing, uh... oh, mic is too low. My apologies. Let me uh, go ahead and well, so I'll leave it here on the stand. But let's see if I can turn that up. Please let me know if you can hear me, because if I'm going to keep trying to explain uh, what I'm doing, it does help to be able to hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, zip dot dee 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 dot dee dot dee la la dee la lo. Ah, much better. Okay, good. And hey, my pleasure. Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. It really does help if you can uh, hear what I'm saying. All right, so uh, when we're doing something like, uh, well, specifically edge highlighting, right? You've got uh, all your uh, uh, space marine tanks and whatnot, all the rhinos. You've got uh, Lehman Russes for your guard. Heck, every one of those little panels on the uh, Eldar vehicles. Uh, I'm assuming I've got some 40K players in the audience today, obviously. Uh, but either way, you're trying to do those highlights. Like I showed you how easy it is to do it just on the flat surface, but it's so much easier to do it on edge highlighting. Um, so if you are one of those people who wants to do edge highlighting and you've never seen this before, um, I'm sorry for all the work you put into mastering edge highlighting with a brush. And um, you're welcome because... Oh, I'm an edge highlight. <laughs> Oh, I'm a subtle edge highlight. <laughs> it is uh, ridiculously easy to do all of this with a pencil. Uh, if you're doing uh, really, really fine areas, uh, I just take my uh, hobby knife and uh, shape the tip of the pencil even finer uh, to ensure that I can get into like some of these little spots right here. I'm not going to try and get those with this pencil today. Uh, in no small part because I'm not going to sit here and shave a pencil. I've got plenty of other stuff I can do uh, for the show, and uh, this does not have to be finished today. But I still want to highlight that a little better. Yeah. So there's my nice little edge highlights and all of that red. And if I burnish it just a tiny bit, that white becomes translucent enough to really pull in the color around it. Uh, in the way that you can uh, very easily use just black and white uh, with any color uh, to create, well, a chipping effect or highlights and shadows. Um, so, too, in this case, I can highlight my red with pure white, and uh, it does not look out of place. And with a pencil, it's great. All right. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, if there are questions about the pencil uh, techniques, uh, of course, just let me know. I reach over here for some of my handy dandy secret weapon paints. Thanks again to my buddy Mike for the uh, great stand here. The 3D printed stand he made for uh, the paint lines. So I've actually got uh, two of them in here, one for each of the uh, lines. And I want Neo White. So here's my Neo White. And uh, so I was using Comet Red on the outside. So I need Comet Red on the inside, which is this one. No, you're going to be like Neo Burnt Red. Yep, you're Neo Burnt Red. Look at me. No one colors and stuff. Odessa Red. Where the heck are you? Charge. No, zippity, zippity bop. What? Well, you're Neo Burnt Red. I already checked you. Well, that's because it's the last color in the series, Justin. <laughs> uh, although I'm going to want a highlight, so let's go Neo Pink. All right, so the last time I touched the cab, hopefully I don't bump all 
couple of things since I forgot to bring my water bucket down here. It's one of the few uh, hobby tool gimmicks that I actually really enjoy. Is uh, I have a couple of different ones. These are uh, uh, three container pots, and uh, on one end, I'm looking for the right brush for this project. Here we go. On one end, they're actually ridges down there so that you can uh, scrub at your brush if you need to. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you've got your dirty water, your cleanish water, and then your clean water. And, uh, you know, having done uh, bartending and dishwashing, well, that three step system works really well to get uh, all of that clean. So I like being able to have it for my brush. I uh, got one for my kid, too, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's one of the few uh, little gimmicky things that I uh, uh, really do enjoy having. I see a lot of things come through the market where, hmm, yeah, little fads. But again, I am a grumpy old modeler. All right. I'm just going to take my uh, Neo White and go bloop right onto the seat. It does help to actually say bloop. You might not think so. You might say, that Justin's a kidder. But no, no, it really helps. It also helps to have a substantially larger brush. After saying I wanted to make sure I grabbed the right one, I did not. So let me uh, three step wash that brush. Then get this one. Boop. Welcome to Watching Paint Dry with Mr. Justin. Today's subject, an off-white. I actually imagine I could sell that show as something that came on like right after the uh, Great British, uh, British Baking Show. Now, if you've been watching the progress of this for a while, you may recall that the seat that I'm working on right now is actually a cover. Uh, I took foil and embossed it over the original seat so that I matched the texture and shape, uh, but also so that in spots where I've already started, um, I could weather that and start to break it up. Uh, one of the, uh, while I'm looking at this, uh, I'll mention that one of the custom things I'm going to make is a um, floor mat. Shouldn't have been that difficult. <laughs> uh, and for the floor mat, um, since I'm going to paint this now, I uh, want to get measurements first. Now, lots of ways to do that. But right now, I'm going to take a little piece of paper, rip it up, stick it down in here, get a pen,
and simply do that. Uh, and that is because, well, it's easy. Uh, my other option would be to do things, something like uh, take my calipers out, precisely measure the space. It's floor mat. We'll manage. All right. Back to Comet Red, which again, I'm just going to put directly on the surface. Oh, shake it. Shake it, shake it, shake it. Just shake all of these. Get my awesome, awesome, awesome comet red. Ka chow And I'm just gonna brush it through here. Doesn't matter that it's a thick coat, it's what I'm going for. And of course, I could put the paint on a palette, but again, grumpy old modeler says, uh, why? Just so I can take it off of the palette and do exactly this? Never. You kids these days with your multi-step procedure. Just, oh my gosh. Slap some paint on it. So there are details here on the door, of course, that I'm going to pick out shortly. But by the same token, I'm going to put some Comet Red on the seat in a little while. All right. Not very exciting. I'm going to set that aside. We'll come back here to some weathering. First, I want the wood panels for the deck. I have those right here. So I want these little fun widgets. Yes, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's the dashboard. Here is that other little fun widget that we'll talk about in a minute. These are all of the wood pieces, which means I am definitely missing one. Now, when I'm doing uh, wood pieces like this, to uh, it doesn't matter if I'm making a trench, the pallets, uh, dock. Uh, in fact, I have a dock right here that I can use as an example. Dirgy, 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 dirgy. Don't bump all the camera stuff. We get old. Ahab off of here. And his gear. And the broken panels. So even in the case of uh, this dock, uh, I weathered each of the beams individually uh, and then came in and did some highlighting here where the figure is going to stand. I'm also going to finish putting some putty on the side of the uh, ropes here since it all cuts off, including the braided piece you can see. And I'm working right now on getting that splash to come up the side. And... Don't bump all the things. Excuse me. Uh, so it's the same thing here. I'm going to weather these individually uh and since i'm gonna have to make it looks like two more uh well you'll get to watch that process today but let's confirm hmm. 
And actually, I may not do that today because I'm not sure the wood for that is hand wood. It is not. So I'll look at this and we'll weather around it, um, put it to each side as I'm going, um, and instead get back to work on uh, some pigments and some uh, oil paints here. So in that case, where we leave off last time, I had just put the uh, engine rust on the top of this to weather it down. And I'm actually going to use the same color today. To weather and highlight uh, the hood, actually. So I am, in this case, just putting a bit on the bottom of a Dixie cup. Since I'm going to be doing glazing, I'm going to use a sable brush instead of a talcom brush. You can still glaze with the talcom brushes. I just prefer this. Now remember, of course, the engine rust begins as a translucent color. Uh, it is in a clear base um, and intentionally made to thin and be translucent, and while I use it for, well, I had formulated it for uh, that pinkish color you get over, uh, well, exhausts, uh, thus the uh, exhaust rust, uh, or engine rust, I said in this case. Um, but again, uh, Jessica Rich, a uh, really incredible uh, figure painter and watercolorist, um, uses it to highlight the flesh on her models. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to use it to oxidize a hood. So there are lots of uses for the paint. Remember that it's advertised uh, function is not necessarily its only. I keep mentioning oils, but my goal with this one really is to avoid uh, any use of oils. I want to uh, stick only to the existing Secret Weapon product line. And I'm afraid our oils are still delayed. After Depticon, I'll actually look at uh, manufacturing our oils in-house. Uh, given the problems we've had finding a reliable partner to produce them for us. So I'm just creating a little bit of texture. Again, all with acrylic paint. Let me get the camera controls in hand here. Uh, da, 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 da. Move that to the side. Woo, woo. So you can see, I've got that mottled, oxidized look here. Oh, spot that looks like a little streak there. So let's uh, see if I can still clean that out even with my finger again. Again, I put my hands on my models all the time. I use my fingers to clean off paint all the time. Um, smooth things out, weather things, I do whatever. Uh, but I still hear um, artists say all the time, that, oh yeah, don't, don't put your hands in your model or make sure you're wearing gloves when you handle your model. Uh, again, if your hands are that oily that it's going to interfere with your paint, uh, go wash your hands, because you're gross. Just say it. This brought to you by Grumpy Old Modeler. I 
All right, so there's my start of my oxidization. Let me focus that back over here for you. Boo, boo, boo. All right, um, I'm gonna do a little bit more of this uh, because this is the step well, this is the where I am in the, the process of finishing this model, uh, particularly since I'm trying to do it all with acrylic. Uh, but I'm not going to make you watch me do all of it because it's going to be repetitive and dull. Um, while I'm doing this, uh, it would be a great time if somebody out there has a question or technique they'd like me to review for them. Uh, we can always take a little detour into whatever it is you'd like to see covered. It is, after all, my favorite part of this. Getting your feedback and questions is just great. I love it. And few things make me happier than being able to demonstrate a technique on request. Like that piece we did last time for the rust and chipping. I actually need to finish that because that piece has sold. So I'm going to put a uh, little frame on it. I'm going to make a little custom frame and weather that up a little bit too. And yeah. I've sold some of my rust studies before, but usually on large canvases. So that was a fun surprise. A nice highlight to some rough times recently. But we talk about that a lot on this show, don't we? All right, so rather than hit that whole hood, whole panel, uh, I am going to map just a few sections. I cleaned you off. Definitely, definitely helps to say boop. In fact, the name we call our dog by most often is Booper Snoot. And that's because, well, she has a tendency to uh, wait immediately next to a door when you walk out to the garage. And then when you walk in, you hit her in the face with a door every time. Even if you're looking for her and you know that she's going to be there, you still seem to smack her in the face every time. And so we started calling her Booper Snoot because every time you open the door, you Booper Snoot. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put that uh, discoloration very heavily at the top here and right around, carefully around. Again, even with a big brush like this, this is on the number two, right? Yeah, number two. Uh, the tip is very fine. Um, with a little practice on your brush control, uh, you can still do eyeballs with a number two. Not that I recommend it. out that little section and now it looks 
very much like old water deposits. Just let me get back on the manual focus here. Skadoosh. Ow. That didn't work. There we are. All right. And again, since that's how it's going to photograph, I'm going to clean it up a little more uh, because it looks harsher in this light on the camera. Plus, cleaning it up a little more will add a little more visual interest. There we are. Look at that. Boop, boop. Dee -doo, boop, boop. All right. So again, this is all acrylic. Uh, it's the sort of thing that I used to use oils for, uh, but now I, well, I largely use our acrylics. Uh, and not just because I get them at a substantial discount, but because I formulated them to work this way. Uh, they're not just colors. Um, the different colors have different properties to, well, perform differently, much like this. All right, but let's do one last bit with the engine rust since I have it, because I really want to get that line right across here. Nice coat. And then across the re-weld right here. Let that dry nice and heavy around that edge. We've already got some pigment here, but this will help simulate the uh, accumulation of water in a very different way, which is why I'm now, whereas before I was mapping it uh, randomly, uh, I'm now going to pull down some streaks. and make sure that as I'm working, I continue to align with uh, gravity. It's always wise to align with gravity. You do not want to argue with gravity. Gets you every time. See if I can dry that off just a tiny little bit for you. And focus! Again, here is the hood mapping. But now also uh, streaking along the edges here. Streaking there. Ooh, can we get them? Can we get them? Oh, see how subtle that is? Oh, yeah, I know you can see that. Yeah, that's subtle. I like it. And again, all acrylic, uh, so you don't uh, necessarily invest in uh, uh, a lot of uh, fancy tricks. Um, but yeah, we're going to come back and finish that off in a bit. So for now, though, let's do something a little more interesting, like check to see whether or not the super thick slab of paint on here has dried, and it has not. Uh, in fact, there's still a big old puddle of it right there, so let's... Spread that out so it dries. Really want to work on the uh, cab too. Chances are good, if it lasts uh, beyond the broadcast, I'll wind up uh, doing that later in the afternoon. Get that focus back where we want it. Awesome. All right. Mm, 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 mm. We got the thing of the stuff. Uh, let's take a second to check in on the dashboard. Uh, so I've done the uh, basic assembly for the dashboard here. And uh, 
I took the panel here out where the stereo would be uh, so that I can get some wires poking through, uh, make it look like the stereo was stolen. I was originally going to have the uh, dashboard pocket open with stuff inside, um, but the cut uh, of that um, compared to the plastic uh, is just, it's not worth the effort uh, for the subtlety of that uh, effect. Uh, the French have a uh, great saying for that, which I won't repeat here because it's uh, also crass. Um, I am still tempted, however, to also open the ashtray uh, and actually put uh, some cigarettes and ashes in there. Um, but for the moment, the important thing was to check fit and all of that with everything going on over here. And as you can see, things are still great. But I'm going to finish and paint that separately. Uh, the other thing I am debating, even though it's not hap uh, has not happened on the uh, uh, actual real life reference uh, truck, um, is using a crackle medium to create a uh, broken vinyl top there. Which I'll mostly do just because I really like the effect and it's fun to create. All right, let's see then. Do I want to do painting? Do I want it to do pigments? Hmm. You see, without your questions, I just sit here and decide what I want to do. And that gets crazy. Hmm. I'll dump the wood out. Since I can't finish that part today. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna do a bit more with the uh, engine rust here. Get some of the rest of this model oxidized. Uh, we already have some of that effect uh, through here with the pigment application from last time. But that is the heavy fade. Now I'm going to make that a bit more subtle and use the engine rust to blend that in with the area around it and again i've, I've been the engine rust uh a bit uh, you guys have watched as i've done it um doesn't take a lot because it starts translucent and uh yeah i hope you can see that it's it's really simple to create these effects uh sure it takes a bit of practice um, you can make mistakes along the way, uh, but that's how that works. Uh, last week, uh, for Workbench Wednesday, I, I did tried to do two pieces uh, with the uh, same paints. Um, and one of them just turned out horribly. Just the paint all peeled off. It was just horrible. Uh, the other one turned into this, using the same paints, same techniques. So even when you know what you're doing, there's mistakes that happen. That's okay. That's normal. If you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. I forget which of my... Uh, which show I was watching with my son recently where I heard this phrase, but I really loved it. Uh, if you only do what you can, you will never be more than you are. So get out there and take some risks with your model. And have some fun. The worst that happens is that you ruin a model. <laughs> so buy some inexpensive ones and just have a good time. Uh, I'll use it as a product plug too. The uh, uh, Secret Weapon sells our practice sticks. Uh, and while it does not include vehicle components yet, um, yeah, it's a good way to uh, practice painting uh, in a very low risk situation because it's not a complete model. Uh, 
Uh, and then once you're finished with your practice, you can uh, dunk it into some isopropyl, uh, scrub it off, and hey, you're right back to it. So again, I'm using vertical brush strokes to help pull this down and create a vertical streaking effect. Getting a little pool in some of these uh, indentations to help draw attention to them. Again, even when it dries, it's going to be translucent and subtle. Speaking of Booper Snoop, I'm surprised she's not in here. Now I miss my dog. I'm not thinning this anymore. I just cleaned off my brush and dabbed it off. Now this specifically will help draw attention to all the little dings and holes and whatnot in the back of this. But still need it to be somewhat subtle. Ish. <laughs> Trying to take very little out of those holes. But you can see how I'm creating just that random mapping here. Texture mapping. Boop. Boop. The system keeps making that new chat message sound at me, but I don't see any, so let me refresh that real quick. And hopefully there's a, that's a mistake and you guys aren't out there sending me messages that I'm not seeing. That would make me sad. I like your messages. Now I'm just, <gasps> wait, I'm edge highlighting with a brush. Still do that sometimes too. Uh, in this case, specifically because I want this color. Using the same oxidization color, or same color for oxidization, uh, will help create some color harmony on the model. Um, in no small part by making it a uniform filter. Before I get back to just more color mapping, we'll talk about that surprise. <laughs> I've also, since I uh, lowered my chair, adjust that for you. So on the back of every pickup truck like this that I've ever seen, not the one in question though, to be fair, uh, but on all the rest, uh, that rear bumper pretty much always has a vise. So I took the time to 3D print this cute little fella. Found that on Thingiverse. 
And my intention is to add it to the bumper. Now, of course, I'm going to uh, heat up the bumper to do some damage uh, to it. And then, uh, well, I still need to figure out where I can put this so that the uh, boot would still open. Um, and one of the things I'm actually thinking about doing is uh, welding a panel onto the side here so that it actually sits like right here, uh, because I've seen that too. And uh, hey, Noel, uh, thanks for your question. Yes, I would be happy to provide you with a close-up of my rear end. I need to go get the other glasses for this. <laughs> Hopefully that's in focus. For you guys and not just for me. So again, this is a combination here of the pigment, but also the acrylic. So you can see that mapping through here. Where we'd have the water buildup, the oxidization and all of that versus the dirt built up down here in the corners. Same thing on the sides. So again, this is all acrylic. This was not the pigments. And this is a combination of the pigment and the acrylic. But then I've done that as a filter. Actually, I have not done the filter on this side. I need to do it on that side. I've done the filter on this side. So with that acrylic, I have managed to create some texture some highlights, the streaking, and again by using it as a filter over the whole surface, uh, create a, a nominally more harmonious piece. You know what I need to do. I know what I need to do. Come on, folks, we're going for a ride. We. Let's get you right up close and personal with the work. Here we go. And focus. There we go. Let's just bring the camera right up in close. Let's. Uh... That way you can actually see what I'm doing while I'm doing it. <laughs> Cheers to you. And thanks, Noel. All right. So on this side, I still need to come in. Just getting my brush wet. You'll see I wipe it off my, well, you won't see. I wipe it off my towel. But I want to make sure there's moisture in the reservoir. Uh, that's why when I'm glazing, I like these uh, sable brushes, particularly the... Uh, uh, Raphael's of the Sharps. They just work for, well, how I work. So I'm just hitting this whole top edge. I need you on this side too. Making noises always helps. I actually sometimes have difficulty not whistling while I work. I actually do. Enjoy whistling while I work. I, uh... I'm actually waiting for the Masters of Musical Whistling competition to hit uh, North America again. Uh, my wife and I both intend to compete uh, as musical whistlers. However, I imagine that with my microphone right here that would just be awful but i really do have to remind myself not to do it now i'm adding a little more water because this is dried out that's all you can see i can reconstitute most of it really quick humming is good too i was actually very happy uh, uh again because my wife and i uh both want to be competitive musical whistlers uh we were trying very hard to teach our son how to whistle like oh come on because he would say oh i'm whistling woo, 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 woo. uh and then he turned around one day 
and I was whistling, uh, what was it, uh, Spoonful of Sugar from Mary Poppins. And he chimes in, in harmony, on key, whistling. Not only was he able to whistle out, he was able to whistle in. <laughs> so at some point he had taught himself to do all of the things that we would have taught him with some combination of self-determination and uh, watching his parents. Um, but yeah, we were shocked. It was something like, wait, wait, what? You whistle now? Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> so now we'll pick tunes together and whistle them. <clears throat> he is a great kid. and We're very lucky to have him. So again, trying to keep the effect fairly subtle. But now to give you a comparison, I'm like, where haven't I done this? I have not done this on the back. Hmm. And I'm not convinced that focus is quite right. So give me one second to go. Yeah, that's better. But you can see now that mapping effect that I got largely with the acrylic, especially down here. So again, see how the uh, chipping here, um, it stands out very sharply. Uh, and sometimes you want that, you want the but on an old truck like this, not so much. So again, I'm going to do this time half and half. Let me get some fresh paint on there. Humming Phantom of the Opera. I have to say that uh, Phantom of the Opera, well, I think that Andrew Lloyd Webber created one good musical, and that was Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, I'm not a fan of the, the rest of his work. Um, I've tried really hard. I know that uh, Phantom of the Opera is my wife's favorite uh, of the musicals. Um, not so much for me. I love the production values of the shows, though. I really do. I know it's kind of a cop-out, but uh, it's true. I'll still go watch Phantom of the Opera just to see what what they've done differently with the stage this time. All right, so half and half. Are we in focus? We have focus. I am going to, because the chips are mostly on the driver's side, do less than half. I'm going to do this area. So heavy coat. And now I'm using a subtractive technique with my brush. So I take some off, I wipe it, start to see how pink some of these areas are, pull, pull, and again, because of the base that I chose for this color uh, to get this effect, uh, you see that I have a fair bit of working time. And that's the difference of paint as color versus paint as function. Which is really the philosophy behind all of the secret weapon products. It's got to be function. All right, so now, with the mapping in place, you get that nice streaking and everything. But also notice how 
the panel is softer. And even with this big old chip, the effect is softer. And again, this is just with acrylic. So now, of course, I'm going to do the rest of it. This part's largely covered up by the bed of the truck, but... And I'll say again that uh, if anyone out there has a question or a technique you'd like to see demonstrated, let me know. Uh, I'm just in here painting a model for fun at this point. So I would love to answer your questions. Uh, and if you don't have them, that's okay too. We can just hang out and enjoy this truck together. I appreciate your company. Oh, uh, Noel asks a really uh, excellent question here. Uh, would I still be using the same engine rust color for this over a different color? Uh, and the answer is yes, um, as I already have on the white up top as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, the color, um, well, it really did start with that patina you get on uh, old exhausts. Uh, yeah, I use it as an oxidization color all the time. Um, whether it's here on the red, it's here on the white, especially through here. So this was not pigment. This is all paint. And I'm still going to come in, and you can still see some of the streaking here. Harder on the white today. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's still the same engine rust color. And hey, Charles, I'm glad you have internet. It's nice to have your company again. Thank you so much for joining. I might have to go fix that. All right. Let's see. Where were we? Oh, I have no idea. If I have to ask you where I am, we're all in trouble, right? <laughs> all right. Let's take a look. Go back over here at the cab. I have to remember to be gentle because I don't want to break it yet. That still looks wet to me. Oh, yeah, you're still very wet. But not so wet as I probably can't get in here and just do some stuff. wet for me to get in there and do stuff still. Darny darn 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 darn. All right. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Whatever. I don't even care. It's not like I want to do stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'm going to come back to the bed and the cab. Oh, right. I was going to finish uh, weathering the back half of this. And then, if there aren't any questions uh, or something else you'd like to see done, I'm going to get back to work on uh, building the uh, undercarriage and all that. I hear the clippy-clop of little puppy feet. Little puppy feet. She's 63 pounds. Hey, Smoochy Pooch. Hi, my baby dog. Did you come to get say hi to Papa? Oh, look at that waggy tail. Pardon the interruption. Bye-bye. And that was it. Just wanted me to know that she'd woken up. Oop, sorry, I'm off camera. All right. 
really is interesting to me how much uh, harsher it appears on the camera. Uh, but I like it because it's a good reminder to me to keep towing it back anyway. Even if I think it's subtle. <laughs> I mean, I am known for my subtle weathering, right? All right. So now, when we put that together, it's going to be invisible. However, that little gap right there is what I'm worried about. But mostly I did that so that you could see the effect, because otherwise I would have just left it. It's not really relevant. more of that subtractive technique on the side there which means I've very nearly finished the oxidization and color mapping for all of this now I can just kind of keep going uh, and the reason is uh, really at this point uh, the more time I take it's just creating layers of subtlety um, you can at some point uh, overdo that. Not that I have ever overdone the weathering. No. But, okay, yeah, all the time. Uh, but really just coming back and, and going back over each section and, and looking for those spots where something doesn't stand out as correct. Um, remember that weathering is the interaction between the subject and its environment. Uh, my favorite story about this is that I was uh, uh, judging for the best weathering trophy uh, at uh, a ReaperCon event. And there was a uh, model from Pegaso that I've always wanted. Um, Zulu Warrior, big piece. And uh, living, breathing, I mean, the, the paint job was just fantastic. This man was alive. Uh, the desert base that it was on was absolutely one of the best that I have ever seen. And something about it bugged me. And it actually took me to the second day of the show to realize what it was. His feet were clean. So someone had taken the time to paint this beautiful model, create this beautiful desert base, but then never bothered to put the two together because his feet were clean. His feet could not have been clean because he's barefoot in the desert. So I pointed that out to some of the other judges and uh, yeah, and it was uh, Aaron Lovejoy uh, caught up with me at Adepticon uh, like a year or two later and said, hey man, I want you to know that you can check the feet on all of my entries <laughs> and they're all weathered. And uh, yeah, I really want to get uh, little lanyard stickers made uh, uh, that uh, and say dirty boot and give it to all the modelers that uh, remember to weather their feet. <laughs> but again, I am grumpy old modeler. You know, weathering's not just rust. Weathering is snow. Weathering is 
what happens after they salt the roads? Weathering is just the interplay between the subject and its environment. If you watch the original Toy Story, first you will be pain at how bad that animation seems now. And then take a look in the first couple of minutes of the show and note that Andy's door is chipped and has shoe scuffs on it and is weathered as it would be uh, for a child's door or an adult's door <laughs> if your own door has a bunch of dings in the bottom of it. Two fair ours came with the house but we just never bothered to fix it. So again, this is all acrylic. All of this detail, color mapping and weathering. All acrylic, all those water spots. Even here on our uh, scratches and chipping and this was all done with Comet Red and Neil White. Love these colors. And I want that door to really stand out so I think I've managed. <laughs> there we go. Nice and in focus. All right, I'm going to take a brief break, everyone. Uh, I actually uh, need to visit the facilities. And I will be right back and continue work on the model. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll still be here and uh, yeah again if there's any uh, if you have a question or there's something you'd like to see or a technique you'd like to see demonstrated let me know and uh, when I get back I'll be happy to make this show all about you I'll be right back
<laughs> and I'm back, obviously. I'm also a goof, but I suspect you knew that when you got here. Unless you're a first-time viewer, in which case... Welcome to the Madhouse. Alright, so back to the truck. I want to work on the truck, truck, truck. Here we go. The cab is finally dry enough, yay! So I'm going to put engine rust back on my shelf. I'm going to come over here and grab dark iron engine metal tire black. Your tire black, right? Uh, get out. Oop, your rubber. Wrong color. Tire black. Actually, I want tire black and rubber. So again, the colors I'm going to be using now for very different purposes are to do some metallics. I'm going to use a dark iron and engine metal. Dark iron is my favorite metallic color of all time. Um, it really was the thing as we were uh, developing the line of the, uh, the first range of secret weapon paints, the weathering line. Um, I had high expectations and every time uh, those expectations were, uh, the results exceeded my expectations. And uh, Dark Iron was one that literally just made me giddy. I could not believe how well it worked. But alright, I also have Tire Black and Rubber. I want one more. I want light dust or handle wood. Your handle wood. You're not going to want it. I want light dust. And that's for some uh, fabric weathering. Let me get the legs of my chair to cooperate. There we are. Alrighty then. Comet Red. Starting out with uh, Comet Red. Back into the cab here. Do not need my watercolor pencil or my table brush. Put my tools back where they belong. Grab a much smaller brush this time. Get it wet, dry it off. Hmm. And this is another Talcon brush. Again, I do most of my work with Talcon brushes. So what I'm doing at the moment is just thinning that out a tiny bit and getting it all the way into the brush. So well saturated. Coming on here. Change the way I'm doing this. Doing it for your angle is not working for me. Hey now. I'm hoping the mic doesn't pick it up, but we have a storm rolling around outside, and uh, my neighbors have a very large wind chime uh, by their front door that is just going nuts.
hear me. Stop taking off paint. That's not helpful. All right. There's the start of that. Except that's not straight. Boop. Now it is. Clean that brush. A little more Comet Red. Boop, boop, boop. Come in here and this time. All along this edge. Just add a little something. where the uh, hole is. <clears throat> I drilled out that section and stuffed it full of foam uh, so that once this is, uh, well, and hopefully today, I'd really like to be able to show you that today. Uh, it's a question of whether the paint wants to dry and whether or not I get distracted by other aspects of this project or something you'd like to know about. All right, I need to let these dry. And move on. So now I'm actually going to get to work uh, doing some uh, assembly. Brush that, OK. Uh, because I need components. First, I'm going to make sure I get this off of my table by putting it into its little thing. Again, if you didn't know, that's what the uh, little Tamiya stand thing is for. It's also, uh, yeah, generally how we uh, hold the models for these. Or I actually used to make my own out of hangers. I would take a hanger and fold it up uh, and then bend it out to uh, hold my models. All right, I need to stop looking at the individual components and get back to building uh, the undercarriage and whatnots. Skadoosh. All right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when I'm working on a kit like this, uh, well, any kit, uh, plastic kit with uh, multiple components, just grabbing a pen. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, I cross out the stuff that I've done and different Sharpie. I was having trouble with this page last time. The gloss paper does not like my pens. Oh, that's why I can't find my big Sharpies. I put them into it bin up here because I have so many of them and in so many colors so I will cross out the stuff that I've done and it gives me a good starting point uh, when I come back to a project if I'm going to skip a section specifically because uh, I want to come back to it later uh, for instance a sub assembly or something like that where I don't want to do this now because, for instance, I uh, put the motor into the engine compartment, things like that. Um, I will circle it to let me know as I'm flipping through the instructions, hey, you chose not to do this. Just little tips, hopefully useful. All right, so we need, I've only got a couple of frames here, so finding the components today should actually be easy. Clippity clippity. Mm, 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 mm. Do I already have a hobby knife on my desk? I do not. All right. Yes, I do. Oh, I did. Uh, 
I had been working on some uh, new terrain releases for us, so <laughs> I knew I had a hobby knife here somewhere. All right. Oh, that's not true. Here I am saying, I'm going to start building, and of course I already took out paints knowing what I was going to do next. How silly of me. Let's put that away and get back to painting. Boom. It's the whole reason I got out dark iron and engine metal, silly Justin. All right. So I am taking the dark iron, and even after telling you guys how excited I was about this paint, how could I forget? Let me get, in this case, uh, a little tiny brush. Again, look at this. Oh, my gosh. Oh. It's, an, it's like graphite in a tube. It's just... Fantastic. So right here, I have a section where they re-welded the roof. So I am going to carefully hit that with the dark iron. Just, <laughs> just off camera. Just in a little line. My brush needs to be a bit more wet. So does my paint. These small brushes um, are really a hassle because the reservoir is so small that paint dries out. That's why I laugh when I see these teeny tiny brushes. People are like, oh yeah, this is the 4,000 aught brush I used to do eyes. And I'm like, you still have to jab it because your paint's gonna be dry by the time it gets there. The reservoir helps keep the paint damp. I was gonna say wet, damp, wet, whatever. There we go. Just like that. Now that blends in nicely at the moment with the rust colors around it. And that's why I brought out the engine metal. This is another one where uh, the flake in here, uh, the metallic flake, is very special and gives us just an incredible um, result. You can thin it so much, it is so subtle and so fine, it's ugh, ah, just lovely. So now I'm going to come in and on top of that weld line, follow the direction of it very carefully. Highlight it. I could dry brush it, but I don't want to because I don't want it everywhere. I really want specific highlights. And yeah, I know how I understand. I think this is my 2 aught, right? Yeah, this is my 2 aught brush. And yeah, I very seldom use it because, again, that reservoir means that I, I can't do much. Uh, I mean, the brushes I use most often are my size 2 and size 0. Well, when I'm using my uh, sables, my size two and my size zero. So, right, Justin, you can't just dip a sable brush in water because that's not how it works. Yeah, so this is the one I usually work with when I'm using uh, sable. But again, most of what I do is uh, with talcon brushes and that, that I've got a whole range of those, literally dozens and dozens of them in the cups over here. I could take you guys on a magical ride onto the uh, wall of supplies here, if you like. <laughs> uh, at some point, I probably need to, uh, well, when it's finally finished, uh, take you on a tour of the uh, remodeled studio. Uh, but yeah, I have so many brushes within reach of where I'm sitting. It's kind of ridiculous. And that includes toothbrushes. Got to make sure you have toothbrushes in your uh, hobby stash there. So I'm going to wipe off my super professional palette. Come back to this thing. 
let's uh, let's fix that red before it keeps making me sad. And then get to some of the detailing inside, which is why I have the tire black and whatnot. One brush or another, I'm gonna get ya. I'm gonna get ya, get ya, get ya, get ya, get ya, brush or another. All right. Woo! I made an earthquake. There we go. Lines did not quite line up. There we go. Yeah. And you remember that I don't necessarily have to hold it so you can see it. <laughs> Every time I make a brush stroke, typically that brush stroke is going to go wonky if I am trying to do it at a specific angle. Still wet, obviously. I very nearly rinsed my brush in my Manhattan. That would have been the first time in a long time. And yes, I would have still enjoyed the Manhattan. Of course. All right. Here we are. Tire Black is next. I'm going to get out my size one. Save the brush just for the shape of it. Uh, and because it's easier to find than uh, any of my Telcom brushes of that size at the moment. Uh, because I have so many more, so much more of them, so many more of them, that, uh, yeah, finding a specific size can sometimes be a chore. Uh, they're all in a cup uh, on my pegboard instead of uh, organized by size. So the tire black is another one that's in a translucent base, clear base. Uh, so it's meant to be somewhat translucent. But then... I put so much pigment into this, um, as well as gloss medium, to get that nice shiny tire color and effect. And right now I'm using instead on the armrest over here. Always take your time. Slowly build out on small areas like that. Slowly build out your line. It's easier to add paint than take it away. So take your time. I'll come back with a wash for the panels here in just a minute. Actually, that's not true. I want that to be completely blue-black. I really do need to start bringing my other glasses to these uh, episodes. How fun. You may not see it, but I'm actually, there you go, resting my brush since I have to hold this piece up. Uh, to get the angle I want. I'm actually resting my brush right here on the side of the model. And I am having so much fun painting this. I might even just run over today. Today's episode from 10 a.m. until, I don't know, my kid gets home. Then when somebody says, hey, why didn't you respond to all these emails? I said, well, I had a broadcast. It just happened to run for seven hours. So 
still blurs the off camera for you. My apologies. Once I moved the, uh, I'm going to scoot the camera just a little bit again because of where I'm working versus where it is. Uh, I like having it closer uh, to the model there, but uh, I feel like I spend more time off camera than on right now. So let's fix that. Right, all right. So now I'm looking at the top. So from the vertical, uh, you can see that there's no paint on the handle here. So I have to get that paint on the top edge. So I did on that side. All right, perfect. Red is still good, except for that spot right there. Let's get that one little spot. Beep. Get out, paint. Wait. Yeah, you found the red. You got that little gap right there, so we're just going to go. Swonk. Smooth up that edge. I want it to run uh, over the sides of that ridge because I'm actually going to add some tire black to this. Don't hold your ferrule just um, as a single stripe. within the red. The actual truck is just uh, red and white on the interior. Um, but I'm going to add that little black stripe pretty much on that little ridge right there. So you have the raised section. And you have the red that expands past it, which is that wide. And that covers two of the raised ridges. So what I'm then going to do is take tire black and hit one of the raised ridges. To help add a little more interesting definition. Yeah, I'm doing it again, holding my ferrules. Holding your uh, brush ferrule uh, is actually a very bad habit. Uh, you have greater brush control if you're not doing that, which is why they make those gigantic long brushes. Uh, it's not so that you can take a 12 inch long brush and hold it by the ferrule. Uh, now the only other painter I know that gets grumpy about holding a ferrule uh, is uh, Jim Waffle, and I complained to him a while back, uh, like, oh my god, I keep holding my ferrule today, like, what's wrong with me, Jim, how do I fix this? Uh, and Jim suggested uh, electrifying my ferrule, so he says, well, the next time you paint, hook up a car battery via wires to the metal part of your brush. <laughs> he actually said ferrule, of course, so that every time you touch it, you get a shock. I was like, wow, Jim, that's um, extreme, but I would totally do it because I'm really tired of having that bad habit again. I like brush control. Brush control is my friend. All right, so there's some messy schmutz here right that little line down here oh there you go now you can see it let me uh, clean off the brush so where'd it go there you go so you can see this white line right here where i'm hitting with the handle now and uh i'm actually going to cut that out um remember again 
remember that this is uh, a foil cover right here. This is not the original seat, which means that that schmutz is foil. All right. Next up, let's get some, uh, let's see, I already used the tire black. Rubber is for highlighting light dust. Bleep, bleep, bleep. But what could the light dust be for? I don't know. Sorry for the accents. We uh, rewatched uh, Megamind recently with our son and uh it's one that it's not a great film by any stretch of the imagination uh even for what it's supposed to be um and i realize i'm a picky film guy that way but i do get that you know entertainment pieces are just supposed to be entertaining uh and this was um it was not great but it was good and uh there you go, now you can see what I'm doing. I'm painting the uh, pockets. Uh, but at the end, uh, without giving anything away, for those of you who may want to go and watch it, um, uh, the villain pretends to be uh, effectively uh, Kal-El, or uh, Jor-El, rather, uh, Superman's dad. So he shows up to the superhero that he has created, and he puts on this act, and he says, I'm your space dad. You're going to be very powerful. And I know because I'm your space dad. And we have thought that was so hilarious that uh, it's been a regular thing around our house now. So if I'm doing the accent, that's why. I generally don't do accents because I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. However, I'm your weathering dad. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to come back later and highlight these pockets with the Neo White. You begin to see we're pulling out all that detail in the interior here. And I will add more. But Mr. Justin, how could you add even more detail? I'm glad you asked, Space Dad. Well, I'm actually going to ditch this cuff. Let's get a new cuff. some tire black and yeah Noel says uh, of course he did which is a reference to Jim Wapple he is uh, well in my opinion probably the uh, greatest single miniature painter uh, on the planet um, he doesn't get a lot of credit for that because he just churns out models and I mean a dozen a day, two sometimes for when he's doing armies and stuff, and uh, that's part of the reason that I think that he's great. Is people forget that when Jim spends an hour on a project, it's generally worth ten of somebody else's time, and he's been at this for a long time. He's an art school graduate and has a wonderful uh, portfolio of. Uh, acrylic on canvas work um, if you ever have at least an hour and a half <laughs> uh, and waffle happens to be around um, please ask him to show you his portfolio he keeps it on his phone and again as long as you have an hour and a half you will not regret it his understanding of light color composition is just exceptional and his ability to knock it out of the park instantly is unparalleled. All right, that is still a bit wet, but let's see what happens. Whew. Start by 
getting some fuzz off here. And yeah, of course, he uh, suggested that I electrify my barrels. I remember uh, Jim did a class. And it was one of those classes where he was using big talcon brushes like this, like I do, like we do, we old uh, grumpy artists. And uh, as the students came in, they started to pull out their own, you know, fancy uh, sable brushes and whatnot. And Jim was like, no, 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 no. That's not the point of this class. Like, if you're here to learn from me, please do the brush I provided. And when his students began to complain, Jim actually said, look, you can use the brush I provided you, or you can paint with your fingers. These are your options. And I loved it. He's a... Uh, he's a teacher that takes no grief. <laughs> I'm not sure that the uh, conventions that... Uh, have him teach appreciated as much as I do, but uh, they should. <laughs> all right, now this is still pretty harsh, but that's all right. I'm actually going to dry brush later, uh, right over the top of this. I just want to add some panel line detail now uh, with some of that tire black color uh, before I come in and do some weathering uh, with pigments and whatnot on the seeds. Now I was lucky enough with one of my previous projects to have someone uh, who knew beading create for me a beaded seat cushion. And uh, my goal is to get another one of those this time, just on the driver's side. I want a beaded seat cushion. Again, it's not in the original inspiration truck but I love those details and I like to be able to put them in there and surprise people I really think that if you have a, a surprise in a model um, that's just so much fun uh, more fun for uh, your viewers uh, you know the people that are looking at your model that are viewing your work um, I think about the uh, incredible work of um, Michael Proctor, uh, who on every one of his incredible creations uh, hides little bunnies and weasels and who knows, uh, little critters always all over his bases, little nooks and crannies uh, that you might not even think to look for. Um, so a little warren of bunnies on the backside of a wood burl base. That's great, you know, giving your audience uh, those surprises is just just fun uh, and that's why you know for my side where I don't do figures as much uh, I like to have things like you know uh, maps and whatnot in the little pockets here because these are still hollow boop boop and I still intend to put a uh, spiral bound uh, Thomas guide in one of them because of course you would have a Thomas guide in a truck like this so you've got to know where you're going All right, so that is the tire black wash. So let's get the rubber highlights. Blorp, 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 blorp. All right, this is a reminder to never just squeeze the pot until paint comes out, unless you want to wear your paint. Oh. It's also a reminder that I don't know where my needle is because I was using it to do the paint job technique last week. There you are. Like, has to be on the desk. So, just take a thing, poke the nozzle. Oh, yeah. Big old buildup. And then get back to blorping. Blorp, blorp, blorp. Much blorp. Many happy.
All right. So this is rubber. That's tire black. And it's part of the uh, tire trio. And I'm using it. Hopefully you can see. There we are. Let's get a little more light. To highlight the edge of the armrest. Give me some difference in color there to help make it visible. Do the same down the center of the window knobs. Window knob. I'm going to fling my microphone all over the world. I hope that was not a horrible, horrible sound for uh, you out there on the internet lands. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of the uh, engine metal now. And of course, load up my brush. Again, this is a size one brush. No little baby brush for me. Load it up, I'm not thinning it, I'm not anything. And go fork. Fork. And then use a light dry brush on that panel. Oop, on that panel here. Uh, not because uh, making that metallic is appropriate, but because it will help it uh, stand out. Um, when you're building uh, a vehicle like this, um, which is going to have a visible cab, which is exactly what this is about, it is important to remember that it's going to sit inside of something and still have to be visible, and you still need to be able to pick out the details. Obviously, I haven't pushed it all the way in. Uh, but yeah, you still need to be able to find the individual components inside. So I will do a partial fit like this on a regular basis. Uh, with a kit like this, uh, it's made to snap into place and stay there. So I don't want to keep putting it in and taking it out for risk of breaking something. Um, but I will do a partial fit like this to look around and be like, all right, is that interesting? Can I see anything? Um, it's also worth remembering, and this is actually advice I got from Jason Eaton, um, one of the most incredible uh, physical modelers uh, in the world, uh, traditional model makers. Um, does a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, studio scale Star Wars stuff, uh, really trying to keep that uh, tradition of um, uh, building, uh, scratch building alive. And uh, one of the pieces of advice that he gave me that uh, I'm always going to be grateful for is that you do not have to put the plastic windows in your models. Uh, I had actually uh, contacted him about a Millennium Falcon that I was working on and uh, said, hey, do you know anybody that does a uh, vacuum formed uh, window set for this? Because the cockpit plastic was, of course, way too thick. The, the clear plastic is always way too thick. And he simply wrote back and said, why would you ever put plastic windows in? They simply impede the visibility. Huh. Yeah. So on a kit like this, the only reason I'm going to put plastic windows in uh, is because I want weathering on the window and some cracks, um, as well as a couple of stickers in the back window. Uh, otherwise, I would not do it. Um, and I may still uh, create or... Uh, try to find vacuum formed uh, windshields for this because I don't want something that's you know two mils thick uh, for that front edge. All right, I babble, I babble, I babble. Of course, that's why you come, right? <laughs> All right, so, uh, right, working on the interior, that's what we're doing. I don't need those.
those anymore right now. So let's take a bit of the Neo White. Boop, boop, Neo White, boop, boop. Yeah, since I can't play music for you, I hope that the uh, endless stream of stories is at least uh, nominally entertaining. All right, uh, I don't need that. I need this. Go away, save a brush. Don't think. Of, well, yeah, I'll need you again to do the striping, but otherwise, man, go away. Uh, Noel asks if I will have shattered glass for where the windows that are no longer there would be. Uh, in this case, no, because it is uh, going to be an active use vehicle. I'll actually have the uh, uh, lawnmower and whatnot in the bed. Um, I'll 3D print those. I already have the designs from a previous project. Um, but that is an effect that I can create. And if you'd like to see that, let me know and I can demonstrate how to create uh, various types of broken and crushed glass or broken and shattered glass rather. I would be more than happy to take that detour for you. Oops. Hey Greg! Nice to have you join us. Thank you so much for coming. We were just discussing uh, broken and or shattered glass. And I am dry brushing things because, you know, I am. So, Greg, if you're uh, jumping in now, uh, please let me know if there's a uh, technique uh, you'd like to see demonstrated or a question that you have. Uh, it remains my favorite part of the job, so uh, feel free. And if not, well, thanks for coming to hang out while I uh, work on a model kit here. Getting back to that 1972 Ford pickup truck that I've been doing for a while. Which is, uh, at least on the exterior, really come together now. I'm very happy with the difference in damage between the driver's side and the passenger side. There's much more damage on the passenger side, even on the uh, edge of the bed. Uh, because again, you're going to pull up on the passenger side. Uh, and because this is a gardener's truck, they're going to slide the bags in and, and whatever right over here, over that edge, every time. Um, so yeah, very happy with how the difference in the two sides uh, turned out. And that is something to consider. Is again, where weathering is the interaction between the subject and its environment, uh, what makes good weathering um, in a, a model scene is that consideration of how exactly the subject and their environment are interacting. We come back to that idea of uh, Andy's door from uh, Toy Story. Um, and yeah, of course it's scuffed and, and chipped and, and yeah, it has to be. It's a kid's door. If it was clean, you would have noticed that something was wrong. <laughs> But I really want to get back to the cab. And there's still a couple of spots where my lines aren't uh, clean enough uh, for my satisfaction anyway. So I'm going to get uh, my number one. I'm number one. 
Field number two. Okay. Don't need to make sure that the angle is right for you. I need to make sure that the angle is right for me and then see how I can adjust. Otherwise, I won't be able to paint. And if you can simply just watch me screw up, well, that doesn't seem like a lot of fun for anybody. Eh, that's not true. That could be fun. I actually, uh, oh, wait, oh, like those thought out details. Yes, Greg, I agree. I like those thought out details. When you can tell that somebody really put the effort into how, particularly in, in my case as a you know, lover of all things vehicle, uh, how the vehicle would be used, where it would be used. It's one of the examples I give is people say, uh, uh, when I ask for uh, questions uh, after my classes, I always say, hey, you know, feel free to contact me at any time with a question. Uh, but specificity is key because if you're going to ask me, how would you make mud? I'm going to write back with pigments and acrylic. It's true because the mud in Vietnam is very different than the mud on Mars. And you can have mud on Mars because we play in fantasy worlds, so why not? So specificity is key. Um, hmm. Need some more engine metal in here. Little tiny drop, drop, drop. And again, that's uh, the specificity is key, is uh, true to Greg's point, is where I was going with that. There's thought out details. When you've put in the time to think about the specific interactions between your subject and environment. All right, so we have our little pockets. We have our seats so far, which is nice and uh, crunky. Uh, again, the reason I came off of the rise here is that I'm going to put a tire black line on this ridge right here so that it's red, black, red. Uh, but that means that I still have some work to do here in finding those ridges. There it is. And cleaning up my line. There I go. Same down here. I'm not going to hold my ferrule. Just a quick pass. There we go. Remember. Take your time, build it out. Let's see if I can get us both in here. There we go. Build your line out. Because you can always add more paint. Taking it away is much more difficult. And yeah, I'm glad I have that wash on there now because I can actually see the ridge that I'm aiming for. Because I need to make sure I'm covering two of those ridges, not just one. Because again, the, the one closest to the riser here is uh, going to be black.
Well, officially, Workbench Wednesday ended about seven minutes ago. But like I said, I'm sitting here building a model for fun at this point, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, I'm happy to do it. Uh, of course, uh, well, uh, if you guys have any questions or something you want to see uh, covered, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep farting around with this model. I figure if I'm going to spend my time today building it, uh, I might as well bring you guys along for the ride, right? I hope so. Besides, it's great to have company. So here we are uh, with the cab. Uh, again, I'm going to put the black stripes uh, through there. And this schmutzy line down here is going to get cut off uh, with a hobby knife shortly. Uh, because again, this is foil. This is a foil cover over the original seat because I have holes in it so that I can pull out foam. Something crazy like that. Here we go. All right. But now I finally want to get out my Neo Pink. Blorp it. Blorp. There we go. One blorp. And then I need uh, a little one of these brushes. And I'm just going to take the paint straight over here. Woo, what's up, paint? And highlight that center console. The center panel, rather. And that's why that was there. And then I am going to take Neil White. Oh. Along for the ride. Is that a truck model pun? Great question, Greg. Uh, I wish that I had intentionally punned that because I would own my puns. But no, no, no. That was uh, on natural. So, well, that was awful on natural. All right. The other thing I'm going to do is get some Comet Red and fix a spot where I totally screwed up. I might even fix that on camera. So first I'm going to take a little Neo White and highlight specific edges to help augment the texture that I created with the tissue. Because those little pockets are made out of uh, Kleenex. And I mean Kleenex. We use Kleenex brand in this house. So there we go. And I've done that because, again, I'm making this extreme because uh, once this is inside the cab, uh, it's going to be substantially less visible. So I can still take this, do a partial fitting, because, again, this only wants to really squeeze in there once. So I can do a partial fitting and begin to see, hey, how are we looking here? All right, you can see the pockets, you can see the handles. So even though those details are barely visible, we can cheat by overemphasizing them, by uh, putting something in the area to draw the eye. Um, and then, yeah, really make sure that people take the time to look inside of your vehicle. Uh, Greg asks, uh, the tissues as you paint them, is there any issue with paint adding wetness to them? And the answer is no. Um, 
uh, in fact, uh, again, Greg, if you like, I'm, I'm happy to give you a demonstration of, of the technique. Uh, because what I do when I'm working with tissue to create tarps, to create tents, to create uh, little tiny fabric pockets, um, capes, uh, I mix uh, uh, wood glue, PVA, uh, with a little bit of water. Um, and as I'm working with the tissue, I uh, hit it with that uh, PVA and water mix, uh, much like uh, a paper mache, I guess, in a way. Uh, so once it's in place here, uh, no, that is, is very dry. Um, there's no reason for me to worry about adding moisture to it. Uh, additionally, it's already been hit with, uh, you know, a layer of spray, a couple layers of paint. No, it's uh, effectively, uh, well, paint at that point or glue at that point. But all right. I still need that area to dry. So since I'm going to keep going um, a little past the original schedule, and by a little I mean, I don't know, until I get tired of doing this or uh, you guys get tired of playing along, uh, I'm going to take a short break. I'm going to get some more water. I'm going to get another drink. Uh, and I'm going to get some plastic card out uh, so that I can begin to make the... Um, floor mats yay <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna make the floor mats um, get to work on the cab because really uh, with the exception of the uh, undercarriage which obviously I'm still starting uh, the kit itself is is really at a point where uh, it's not finished I'd still say I'm at the 50% mark um, but yeah it's really coming together yeah yay nouns there's a word for that. They Might Be Giants actually has a great song for that. There's a word for that, but I don't seem to know it. And on that note, I'll be back in uh, just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned for more. And uh, again, please, uh, if you have some questions or techniques that you'd like to see covered, let me know. And I'd be happy to do that. Uh, when I get back, I can even do the uh, tissue technique and uh, show you how that works.
And I am back again, so let's uh, get crazy and have some fun. Uh, while I was out, I went ahead and grabbed uh, one of my son's foam blocks. I was uh, going to create a structure out of uh, plastic card and realized uh, I don't want to take the time to do that. I'm also going to show you how to do the uh, tissue technique. So I am going to reach <laughs> to the front of my desk and grab just Kleenex. Uh, actually, I'm going to set these aside. Uh, those two are very wrinkly. Um, still wrinkly. I'll use those later for something. But uh, there we go. Um, I want one that's reasonably smooth. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, uh, I can smooth out the texture on the others. Um, but it's really more trouble than it's worth. Uh, obviously, you can pull out a few Kleenex, um, use them later, uh, and in the interim, find one that's in good shape. As I say, as my nose gets stuffy, excuse me. So in this case, um, one of the things I like to do uh, when I'm making a, a thicker tarp or a tent is to fold that over and use the original fold because you have that nice sharp line across here. You're going to want scissors because trying to cut this with a hobby knife is a mistake. Uh, in fact, let me show you what some means. This is a fresh blade, and I'm going to pull the fabric taut. And oop, oop, rip, 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 rip. Yeah, it's just going to rip. So instead, I'm going to take my scissors. Cut a section off here. Now I'm still going to use this for something else, perhaps in this demonstration here. But now what I have is there we go. This bit. Now, with two ply tissue, you also have the benefit of do 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 being able to separate plies. So I'm going to do that. But first, I'm going to fold this back in half and cut it yeah, about in half. So now I have a two-ply sheet over there and I'm going to have two one-ply sheets over here to show you the difference. Come on, come on, you can do it. There we are. Voila. So you'll also note this is, well, there's the little black spot, fairly translucent. So keep that in mind when you're working with it. If you're trying to create a uh, like a heavy tarp, uh, say on a uh, personnel carrier or something, like you're playing uh, uh, anyway, any of the World War II games, uh, they all escape my mind at the moment for some reason. But uh, that if you're trying to do uh, like that tarp over a personnel carrier, you're going to want it to be a little thicker. Uh, but it still works because you've got those uh, that shape there, those little ridges uh, on which you can tuck this. Um, what's more is that to create that little folded effect, which you would have from those little fabric pockets, uh, you can do that here to create uh, edges and uh, seams and whatnot. Um, yes, thank you. Bolt action and flames of war, Greg. Those are exactly... Uh, uh, what I thought, um, what I meant, uh, but I can do that. So I'm going to take a pair of tweezers here just for a second, and I'm going to go ahead and start a fold to give you a very wide example. But it means that I can even take this, fold it again to make it tidy. It's easier to do when it's uh, wet, <laughs> but once I start, I have a very limited time to work with it. So, fold that under twice. There we are. So it's thick in order for you to see it, but note how if this was the edge of a canopy, 
put it back in place because you really can't see it on account of it being so white. But I have that nice seam. And all I have to do to make that permanent, ooh, do not spill your giant jug of methyl ethyl ketone, Justin. And don't worry, MEK inhalation is definitely not how I'm going to get cancer. I'm fairly sure I can point to the moment that if I get cancer, uh, yeah, I think I knew when. <laughs> I was a, uh, among all of the other things that I've done, I was a, uh, circus and sideshow performer and so one time at a uh, practice actually I was breathing fire so a mouthful of uh, kerosene and uh, spitting that out to do multiple blasts and my first blast went sideways it just didn't work out um, so I did my spray and, and something went wrong and I don't recall what but I had at least three or four more sprays in my mouth worth of kerosene. And I went, Ugh. oops. Literally the last time I did fire breathing. I was like, and now I have cancer. I'm out. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take the uh, two-ply sheet over here. And we're going to start to uh, form this in place uh, with a different brush. Because this is a big old piece of thing. Hmm. Yeah, I was part of a two man comedy juggling team for the better part of a decade uh, with my buddy Lance. And, uh, one time we were hired to do a rave, which was fun. Um, but Lance was breathing fire. And uh, on his first blast, with multiple blasts worth of kerosene in his mouth, uh, he went too high and a big drop landed on his chin. Not a big deal. Uh, anytime we did this, we always had two spotters on stage. Um, with damp towels. But Lance, when he gets that drop on his chin and decides to uh, react to it, felt that saying, oh, was the best answer. So he opened his mouth and all of that fuel came pouring out and it all caught fire. And he was fine, of course. Which yeah, I'll never forget, like, dude, what? What made you think to do that? And then, of course, it was, you know, not long after or about the same time that I decided to swallow a bunch. And that's when I'm like, you know what? I'm out. I'm not going to do this. I'll teach it. But I'm not going to do it. Breathing fire is dumb. I still eat fire. And eating fire is fine. It's probably... Uh, cancerous as well but you know I already got cancer when I swallowed all that kerosene so all right so here is our very fancy super historically accurate canopy cover for a purple plum block so I have done some work here to contour it Woo! and get it on camera for you. Um, but to give an idea of once we have the PVA on here, how much uh, room you have to work with, I can pick up this section here. Let's go ahead and turn that into an actual tarp. What I'm gonna do is uh, duck out again very briefly. I won't even pause the camera because my bedroom is right over there. Woo, by the way, right over there. 
and then uh, go get the uh, blow dryer and uh, show you what happens when we turn this into a raised tarp. And then, of course, I'll get back to the truck unless somebody else has another question because I love your questions. And I especially enjoy uh, being able to demonstrate for you. now present you with the sweet dulcet tones of the Conair 1875. So what else do you guys want to do? Watching tissue dry with Mr. Justin. What we have here is a two-ply tissue to which a combination of water and PVA, that is to say wood glue or uh, polyvinyl acetate, has been applied, uh, effectively creating a paper mache shell over this very unique purple foam tile. Not surprisingly, this can take a fair bit of time to dry, but blow drying does speed that up. Woo! That's also why I was asking uh, if there's another technique you guys wanted to see, otherwise, I'll get back to uh, working on the uh, truck here. Bye bye, phone block. Oop. Almost. Uh, Greg, I would love to see pictures of your D&D Underdark diorama build. I'm actually going to be doing some uh, Workbench Wednesday videos of uh, the Tablescapes Realms dungeon tiles uh, for my D&D game coming up soon. I'll have the tiles finished well in advance. And here we are. So this is 80-90% uh, dry, um, not entirely. Uh, like right here, it's still very tacky, but whatever. Done blow drying stuff for you. <laughs> it's boring for you, right? But you can see, as I poke at it, the texture that we got here, that's in place. It even wants to pull back. So I can still do a bit of shaping because this is damp, but the texture needs to be settled while you're working before it's completely dry. And at that point, of course you can paint it. It really is effectively paper mache at this point. And then, anything else? All right, so I'm gonna do a little bit more work on my truck, and then I suppose I should probably take a break and get some lunch or something. 
I still see a couple of spots where my line is not straight enough. And hey, Greg, my pleasure. Uh, it really is my favorite part of the job, being able to uh, demonstrate uh, techniques on demand. So I'm now taking my hobby knife and trying very carefully to remove the bottom schmutzy portion from the seat. Because again, this is a foil cover. It's not the original plastic seat. Ooh, don't do that. Don't pull that up yet. Oh, push it down, there you go. Oh my gosh. Come on, come on, you can do it. There we are. Get a pair of my pliers. Or, psst, tweezers. Pliers, these are not pliers, Justin. It's the uh, foam from under the seat. <sighs> See, better and better. All tidied up. All right. Coffee knife goes away in the bin where it belongs. And then all right I'm gonna come in now with the uh, sable brush again because I want that fine point and I don't want to spend the time looking for my fine point uh, talcon brushes I'm just, just using your acrylic right now so no need for me to get or rather, no need for me to worry about using a, a sable brush. It's okay to do. And I'm going to come in here and on some of these lines, hope that I have the brush control today to highlight them. So you know what I'm not doing a straight line across each one. I am trying to Create a bit of texture mapping here as well. I'm not holding my ferrule. Nobody needs to call Waffle and have him come lecture me. Man, there's really a raging storm happening outside. And I feel bad for my family. My wife is a middle school math teacher. And my son is a student, of course. And uh, yeah, it means that the kids don't get to go outside today, which means my son's going to be super sad about not getting as much exercise as he wants, which is so much exercise. Oh my God, the guy's got to go, got to go, got to go. But my wife will also have to deal with 
a bunch of grumpy junior high kids that also didn't get to go outside. Many of whom will probably show up at your classroom demanding a new jersey. Just because I'm trying to eat my lunch. I only get 20 minutes for this. And I have to go to the bathroom. Go away. Now I still want to put that beaded seat thing on this side. But I'm not sure I'll be able to do that, so. I'm going to go ahead and create the texture I want on the seats. especially since that's one of the spots where I'm going to have uh, some damage. All right. Clean off my super professional palette again. Slancia. Grab my tire black because it's time to get in here and Put that teeny tiny line where I want it. All right, here we go, folks. <sighs> we can do it. All right, here we go. All right, tire black. Damp brush. Full of paint. Nice fine tip. Paint for me, not for you, because this is a line that matters. Can't see it there in this light, so do this one. Right. Voila. And while that's not perfect, it is good enough for what will come after the weathering. And now, because I have been absolutely dying to share this part with you, I have waited so long for this very moment right here. Right here, right now, ladies and gentlemen, a very fine show, a very fine show. Here we go. Poke. <gasps> Watch, I broke it. Ah. 
Come on, Tom. Well, now I'm disappointed because I can't get the foam out for you. I'm actually going to take off the back panel here. Maybe. It's all glued with MEK, so it's fused together, and I don't want to break anything, but the foam got pushed too far back. Under the seat, and now I can't get it to come out. That's enough. Nope. All right. Well, we're going to break a model. Unfortunately, there was no way for me to predict this and no way for me to do this as a sub-assembly. All right, there we go. In fact, at this point, you know what I'm gonna do? Well, realize that these might be the wrong tweezers, and that could be the problem, the whole problem. I am going to get a hunk of chunk of burning foam right here out of the back and instead stuff it in from the front and see if that works because my master plan there obviously didn't work these things happen so i'm just rolling that up make a little ball out of it Oops, there's my little foam ball take that push that right through there seat edge down but there we go it did not go according to plan but we get our effect so here is my foam sticking out of that corner finally but I can also now come through and do things like See the original plastic under there, but now I have a fold. No rip right there. I can paint that plastic a uh, nice dark color. Uh, get in there, leave this up so I can see the foam, or I mean the uh, foil, so I know where I'm doing it. Take this section here. I'm intentionally going to leave it loose like this. And what I'm going to do is take a couple of strips of tissue, little tiny strips of tissue, and I'm going to paint them gray and put them on here like duct tape. Isn't that great? So that's a start on the bucket seat or the bench seat. And yeah, I'm actually going to go ahead and wrap up, which means let's uh, do a quick review. We used engine rust, 
to put a great deal of oxidization and color mapping onto the model. All of this was done with acrylic paints using the Secret Weapon Miniatures weathering and mechline, since this is uh, Comet Red and Neo White. to create all of these effects. And we got some work done in the cab. And of course, got to look at how to use tissue to create tarps and tents and whatnot, just by ooh, putting it on a structure. Let's see if we can even get this one off in one piece. Ooh, ooh, come on, come on, come on, you can do it. So there, I can even, though it's a little damp now, keep that shape if I hit it with a blow dryer to put onto my model later. And that's how you create a tarp. And to create the seam, again, you just fold a section under. And it just takes practice to you know, get to a point where you feel confident being able to do that. And that's all I got. So thank you again for joining me on this Workbench Wednesday. As always, please remember to like and subscribe, uh, hit the little bell, whatever else you need to do to make sure that you catch every one of these. Join us on Facebook, and of course, visit secretweaponminiatures.com. Thank you again, happy hobbying, and I really look forward to joining you again next week.